call in. In 1956, there was a couple that decided to go all in in Wichita, Kansas. And this couple by the name of Dr. J.J. and Elsie Adrian started Glenville Baptist Church in 1956. And this is a picture of them. They came to Wichita with only their family. And they decided that God had put upon their heart to start this church. 1956. That means this church is 62 years old. And let me give you an idea about that. For every 10 years the church is in existence, it loses its vitality. It loses its purpose. When people walk in those doors, they're not excited. When people get saved, it's humdrum. We could watch hundreds of people get saved and baptized, but it's something that we've always done. It's something that we've always seen. It's something that is so common that there's not a thrill within our life. They started this church in three different places. The first place is right here. It's, uh, it's a school. And then they moved from the school to the battery place right up here on Seneca Street. Anybody ever see that little battery place? That used to be Glenville Church. And then they moved here to our first auditorium. 1956, this church has seen a lot of things. Over 62 years old, a lot of people. Millions of dollars have been given to missions. Hundreds and thousands of people have been saved. Hundreds of people have been baptized from 1956 to now. If our church is 62 years old, and it loses vitality every 10 years. It's time that this church decides that we need to be all in again. What does that mean? That means when somebody walks in our doors, we should be excited to see them. I have a pastor buddy of mine that started a church a few years ago. And they, they, they're excited when somebody comes to their door. They're excited when somebody comes in. They're excited when somebody gets their life to Christ. They're excited when somebody gets baptized because it's new it's fresh. And we are the body of Christ. And if we are going to be all in for Jesus Christ, it should motivate us when somebody that needs Jesus comes to our doors. It should motivate us when somebody gives their life to Christ. This should motivate us when somebody gives their life to Christ and is baptized. It should motivate us when some marriage is struggling and they come to church and somebody counsels with them and they are turned around for the cause of Jesus Christ should motivate us. Our, our, so many churches today are just stagnated and dying because they've been in existence and we cross our arms and we say, been there, done that, seen that, doesn't do anything for me. But being all in means somebody else matters. When J.J. and Elsie started this church, what they said is, I'm going to be all in. I'm going to sacrifice everything I had to start something fresh and new. And they did not start this church for them. They started this church for you. We weren't around at that time. How many of you guys were here in 1956? We have two former uh, charter members of this church. Elsie uh, 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 Dixie Ellis and Daisy High. They're two still members of this church that were here when the church started. So this church started and none of us were here. But we all are beneficiaries of what God chose in J.J. and Elsie Adrian's heart to start. So what would it be like if we went all in? What would it be like if we decided that from 1956 until right now that we're going to be all in, that we're going to invite, that we're going to change people's lives? It may not be for us. It may be for the next generation. It may be for the kids' ministry. But we're going to go all in. Can you turn to somebody and say, it's time? Turn to somebody beside you and say, it's time. It's time. Okay. What does that mean? We need to quit playing church and we need to go all in for church Jesus died for the body of Christ we need to go all in you know back in the day in the early 2000s there was a, a phenomenon that started called um, uh, the world poker series and it's called the Texas Hold'em 
series at the time. And in 2003, there was a guy, his name was Chris Moneymaker. Anybody heard of Chris Moneymaker? Okay, I'm going to teach you something today. Chris Moneymaker in 2003 was an accountant. And he won a seat at the Texas World Poker System. And he won that with a $7,000 buy-in. Chris Moneymaker had a king. And the player that he played against, Mr. Farha, had two nines. And the money started getting millions of dollars in the pot. Chris Moneymaker bluffed with that king high. And he won $2.3 million on a bluff. Let me tell you something. You can't bluff God. You can bluff me and you can bluff others, but you cannot bluff God. See, we are playing with God's money. We are living a life for God. You can call it house money if you wish, but what we are saying is everything that I have is on loan from him. Every part of my life is from him. You know, I'm not promoting gambling by any means, but let me say this. If you do play the lottery and you win, you have to tithe. Okay, you just, you just got to do it. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but if you do, it is what it is, okay? We need to pay this building off. So what we have to do is we have to talk about risky faith. Faith, risky faith, is what is always required to start a movement. And the knowledge of what we should do takes work. There are no small movements of God in the kingdom of God. It starts with something that's very important. And it starts with the act of of prayer. The act of prayer. What is that all about? We can do everything that we want to do, but until we get a hold of God, until we say, God, what do you want me to do? Until we take a mindset of, I want to get on my knees before God, and I want God to work within my life. We have a prayer team around here. His name he is led by Vernon Mace. And Vernon's going to come up, or stand up, and he's going to give us a challenge real quick. So, Vernon, stand up there. Whatever you want to tell this church, this is E.F. Hutton, okay? Do you know what E.F. Hutton is? When E.F. Hutton speaks, we listen, okay? Vernon has earned the right to speak, and we are going to listen to what he has to say. Mr. Vernon. I think both of you know me. In my spring of 50 years that I've been in this church, the patient is changing, but the heart is the same. And we're setting. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, let me hold this for you there so you can just speak. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it right there. You're good. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yep. We're setting on great things for this Glenville church. But it's going to take every one of us, every member, every man and, and woman in this church has a personal ministry. And I'm going to tell you about two of them right now. That we can have a personal ministry to the cause of this church. And if we don't do something, this world system is going to swallow us up. It has for a lot of churches. The lives of change is not the easiest thing in the world to raise a family these days. But I pray for these young men. Let us grandfathers know the stuff that you're made out of to raise your families in this church. Grandfathers, teach these young men. That's what we're that's what we're supposed to do. You can tell I'm not used to this microphone. Every Sunday morning, at 15 minutes before their service, at 10.15, we have a pastor's prayer partner ministry in the pastor's office. And I want to challenge you because it's going to take that. It's a personal ministry for the cause of Christ. That you have a personal ministry. What do you do for your church? I stand for prayer every Sunday morning. It's my personal ministry for the cause of Christ against the darkness, against Satan and all demonic powers. And if you think that's serious, that's what's happening today. Our country, America, wouldn't be in this crossroads today 
if we just understand the back to the foundation of everything. I challenge you next Sunday to come a little early and each and every man, young men, grandfathers, if that pastor's office is not big enough, we got bigger rooms, come in and stand for prayer. When God sees this and Satan sees this, A few months ago, we had a wake-up call here. And we have a chance for this 2018 to set all kinds of records for the cost of Christ, for souls to be saved and lives to be changed. And that's what we're here for. We're children of God. We have a responsibility. And if we don't share that with one another, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to stand together and be together throughout eternity. And if we don't start now and get acquainted with one another, not too long ago I embarrassed myself by asking a young couple, How, are, are you new? How long have you been in here? And they said, five years. That's not a very good record for to be acquainted with one another. So I just pray and that you will accept this challenge. And this will be your personal ministry. If you women, Debbie Scott, see her, she'll let you know what time the women come here to pray. And men, understand this is the basis of it. And if we don't follow through, and we let Satan, the prince of this world, and this world's system have authority over us when we know the truth. It'll be a sad situation in our hearts and minds for the cause of Christ. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity here. And that this message comes across this pulpit this morning. Open up every heart that we're part of it. This is our life. This is where we live. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. When I was 35 years old, I became pastor of this church. And um, Vernon probably has prayed for me more than any person in my life. And uh, uh, he has my respect and he has my honor because Vernon prays for this church and he prays for you individually and he goes around, he prays in every classroom every Sunday morning, he prays over every chair in this auditorium. Vernon is a man of prayer and uh, he, is, he has our respect for our church. Vernon's one of those guys that decided to go all in. There was a time in our church where we lost a lot of older generation. They left in groves because of philosophy and because of preferences. But there was a remnant of an older generation that said, this church is not going to die. This church is going to live. And it's going to thrive. And there was a time before I became pastor of this church that this church was about ready to close. It was struggling. It was struggling in personality. It was struggling in finances. It was struggling just to keep the doors open financially. But that remnant that said, I am staying, kept this church alive. And we are so thankful for that remnant. Because because of that remnant that kept this church alive, we are here today. We are winning people to the Lord. We're changing people's lives. We're helping people out. And that remnant that kept this church alive, it started in 1956 and in about 1990 some, this church was struggling. But I would tell you today that this church is well. It is strong and it is focused. 
And I want to tell you today that this church is not going to stay where it is today. This church must move forward. This church must look at the future and say the future is more important than the past. I can love the past. I can be excited about what the past has done for me. But the next generation is more important than my generation. The people that are not here is important to what we have. When we go all in, we are guaranteed to win. It may not be what you like. It may not be the style that you like. It may not even make sense. But when we go all in, God guarantees us to win. I don't know about you, but I've read the book. And I know at the end of the book, I know what happens. Jesus is the conquering king. And if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I know my eternal destination is secure and I'm going to heaven. But what he has called us to do is not to be happy in church. Not to sit in our complacency and our comfort and say, you know what, I'm happy, I'm saved, I'm content. But what he has called us to do is what he called the early church to do. And the book of Acts is talking about a church. He's talking about a church that was started out of, out, of, out of need. And Jesus said, the story of the early church is the church of men and women that decided to go all in. It's always been that way. A story of people that decided, I'm going to go all in. You don't go into your marriage thinking, I'm going halfway in. You don't start a business and say, I hope I win. When we start something and we're risk takers, we're saying, I am all in. And there's nothing more important than the body of Christ. There's nothing more important than your eternal salvation. There's nothing more important than your family giving their life to Christ. And so often we go halfway in spiritually and we wonder why our kids are not following after us. But what we must do is say, in my home, in my family, at my work, at my church, I'm going all in. Justin chose a song that we finished with today. I surrender all. Do we? Do I surrender what's easy? Would you be like J.J. and L.C. Adrian in 1956 to say, I'm going all in? What would our church be like? If the remnant of what we have today, and we say we are starting a church. Could you imagine what our church could be like if each and every one of us said, today we're starting fresh. Today when somebody walks in those doors and they need Christ, they're not an inconvenience. They're a priority. When somebody gives their life to Christ, oh, well, I've seen that before. No, we're excited. The heavens are open when somebody gives their life to Christ. Why wouldn't the church be excited? When somebody gets baptized, they're saying, fresh and new, I want to start my life for Christ. We should stand up and celebrate. We shouldn't say, another baptism, taking another three minutes out of my day. Wow, our priorities have goofed up. After 62 years, if we do not understand that going all in means it's a priority within our life. You know, I want to talk about the story of the church. Talk about the early church. And do you realize the early church started it and we are here today because what happened 2,000 years ago? When Jesus Christ died on the cross... He was buried and after 40 days he was talking to his people and 10 days after his ascension came the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came upon those early believers and with power they had the privilege of speaking. I want to talk about the church today. So often we grab our Bibles and we listen to sermons but we do not rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say the Holy Spirit. We're a Baptist church and we need to believe in the Holy Spirit, right? We have a Baptist church that believes in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us power, gives us authority, and gives us clarity on what the Bible says. And we need to live within that power. The early church on the day of Pentecost, they didn't go out and witness before Pentecost. Jesus said, I am going to leave and the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be able to preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thousands of people gave their life to Christ. Peter, the biggest goof up around the world spoke and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. You know what? You know what the church is made up? Back in the early church, 
back in the New Testament, back in the Old Testament, they are made up of a bunch of goof-ups. And you know what? God still used those goof-ups. Let's hear some names. Abraham. He was a goof-up. The man of faith. He said, you know what? God, you promised me a descendant upon the sands of the sea. And yet, I don't believe you did that. So he slept with his handmaiden. And they had a son by the name of Ishmael. And then Sarah got pregnant and they had the son of Isaac. And from the time that Ishmael and Isaac was born, this world has been in a fight of Ishmael and Isaac. And then you think about Noah, a man that, that saved the world from flood. And he got done with the flood and he saved his family. And he got drunk and exposed himself in front of everybody. You think about Jacob. A deceiver. His name was turned to Israel. And Jacob was a deceiver. He was a liar. But God still used him. You think about Peter. Think about somebody that denied Christ. And Jesus had to restore him. You think about Paul. You think about a man that was a persecutor of the Christians. Put his, put his family. Put his faith put everything behind him and all he wanted to do was crucify and hurt the church and he had an encounter with Jesus one day on the road to Damascus Jesus went right before him and said why are you persecuting my family and that day he was changed from Saul to Paul that man wrote two thirds of the New Testament was he a goof up? yeah but when God intervened within his life, it changed everything. And probably the most well-known goof-up in the entire Bible was David. A man after God's own heart. Had an affair. He was a murderer. But Jesus still used somebody that was a goof-up. And you know our church? We're full of goof-ups. But God can still use each and every one of us where we are. I want you to take your bulletin. And I want you to write something in your bulletin. Right there on the sermon series. I want you to write one statement for me. Are you ready? What will the story be of me? Write that down. What will the story be of me? 20 years from now. 30 years from now. Even 50 years from now. What will your story be? You know the old illustration about life and death. We've had a lot of funerals here lately. And you go out to that funeral home and you go to the cemetery and, and you do a funeral and you look around and you see a guy's name or a woman's name and you see the birth date and you see the death date. And you know the story. What's in between is the dash. And we are still in our dash. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you're still in your dash. Your life has not been completed. I don't care if you're 90 years old or you're 5 years old, you're still in your dash. Your dash mode. Your story mode. Until, you, until I preach your funeral, God is not done with you. And what we must do is we always must do until I take my last breath, I'm an influence with somebody. Whether it's my kids or my grandkids, I'm an influence. And what I must do is I must live that dash to the fullest. We're never living our life to ourselves because it's all the actions that we live. So the book of Acts, that's a weird name, isn't it? Acts. What does that mean? The book of Acts was written by the actions of the early church. And what the early church taught us, what we need to do, it's all about our actions. It's about our faith. What will our story be like? Don't waste your life while you're trying to live it. Sometimes we look back at our life and we live 30, 40, 50 years old and we look back and what have I really accomplished? What have I done? I've worked, I've raised some money, I've raised my kids. 
but I live a life that's just humdrum. What would it be like if you went all in for your family? What would it be like if you went all in for Christ? What, what does all in mean? That means I'm not the priority, but Jesus is the priority. My kids would be the priority. See, Jesus died on the cross. He went all in. And he loved the church and he loves you. And he doesn't want us to be in a haphazard lifestyle. There is a plan. And there's a plan A. And when Jesus died on the cross, when he went all in, he said, church, there's a plan. There's not a B plan. There's an A plan. And that plan is the body of Christ, the church. Your job is to change the world for Jesus. Your job is not to come to church. Your job is to change people's lives. Jesus died on the cross to redeem mankind, to restore that relationship that Adam and God had. The job of Jesus was to restore that relationship so we could have communion with God. That's plan A. Many of us don't like plan A, but that's what the plan is. So let me tell you what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. But you will receive power. Power. When we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, it is the greatest power unleashed upon the planet. Why is that? Because God has given to you the Holy Spirit. When you gave your life to Christ, part of the triune Godhead came into your heart and came into your life. You are saved and you're going to heaven. But the power that lives within us, the boldness that we can have is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that boldness is in each and every one of our lives. We do not have to live our lives of meekness. We don't have to live our lives in fear and in insecurities because we have the power of God. What exactly has happened? What's happened to you? What's happened to you from the time that you gave your life to Christ until right now? I could ask that same question. What has happened to this church from 1956 to right now? Have we lost the power? Have we lost the thrill? Have we lost what God wants to do within our church? Here's how we practice risky faith. All in faith. Let me give you these three points and these are very important. How do we practice it? How do we go all in? The first one is prayer. You're not going to do anything until God wants you to do it. We can try, but when we pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to change somebody's life? I need to connect with God before I try to connect with others. We get our marching orders from God. And we shall receive power. That means when you're a believer in Jesus, you're not called to enjoy your life. You're called to impact somebody else's life. It's not about you. It's about what God wants you to do. Here's the greatest thing that you can do. When we pray. And God instills within our heart. And a desire to serve. To do something. Is we say okay Lord. Open the door. And I want to challenge you when you pray. Ask God to open. A door. There's a chip. On your chair. I want you to put that chip in your pocket this week. I don't want you to give it out. But every time that you feel that chip. I want you to pray that God opens a door. So often, he opens doors, but we're not ready for that door to open. So we walk right by an opportunity to share your faith, to invite somebody to church. We need to pray. Sometimes we need godly counsel, godly wisdom, or God's word. Sometimes we just need to listen to God. And sometimes we need to pray. So, prayer is something that, as Christians, we have an avenue to do. God wants to hear us. But sometimes prayer is the last thing that we do. 
We don't get up in the morning. We don't talk to God. We don't pray before we go to bed. Sometimes we, we pray a ritual prayer when we eat dinner. But prayer to the body of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit upon us, is to get on our knees, lay in our bed, stand where we're standing or drive where we're driving and just talk to God. And be honest. Don't, don't ask God to be Santa Claus to give you everything. But ask God, what do you want me to do? How can I go all in? And after you pray, you need to plan. Well, you say, well, plans aren't very spiritual, Bruce. And I'd say, really? God had a plan. God had a plan to redeem mankind from their sin. God's plan is to redeem the planet. To restore the original relationship that he once had. Well, you say, listen, hope isn't uh, a really a strategy. Just hoping for it won't really happen. And I would say this. I hope my marriage gets better. I would say, what's your plan? I hope we can get our finances in place. I would say, what's your plan? I hope I can break this addiction. I would say, what's your plan? See, at church, we can hope God shows up. We can hope that God does great things within your life. But God desires a plan. He desires you to put that plan into action. A plan is something, a strategy. Here's what I'm going to do. You know, a philosophy, could I explain this to us real quick? We could have a strategy. We can know what we want to do. We want to move from point A to point B. We want to move from 1956 down to 2018. We know where we want to go, but we don't know how to get there. A philosophy is a strategy. It's the wheels to the cart. I know what I want to do, but the philosophy is I'm going to put wheels to my strategy to get where I need to go. In our marriages, we can say, my marriage is in turmoil. What's your plan? I, 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 I hope somebody comes alongside me. I hope somebody gives me the magic pill. I, I hope that I wake up tomorrow and everything's going to be great. I hope that my marriage changes tomorrow. And guess what? Your marriage, your finances, and your church, and your job will not change tomorrow because you wake up. It's going to change because you have a plan. And you have a strategy. And it's going to change because not your job changes and not your spouse changes, and not your finances changes. It changes because you change. It changes because you decide what you are going to do. So you have to pray, and you have to plan, and then you have to act. You do it. You work the plan. Put your faith into practice. To believe is to trust, and to trust is to obey. Not good intentions, not great ideas, and not just thoughts. It's actions. When God come together, in Acts chapter 2, he said this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wondrous signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and they've done all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them amongst all who had need. So continuing daily, in one accord in the temple and breaking of bread and house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved the early church they understood what was going on the early church wasn't for their satisfaction the Bible says that the early church prayed daily. They understood the power of God and they were in unity. They understood what the job of the church was doing. What would it be like if we had 500 people at the doors? What would it be like if we had 500 people praying for those that walked in our doors? What would it be like if we cared that somebody changed their life? Not that we just had a full house. Not that we cared that we come to church. But we had empathy with somebody that needed Christ. Because God always used somebody with risky faith. We need to pray that our family, we need to pray that our church 
will go all in. Push our life to the center. Say, I'm either going to win or I'm going to lose. But when I gave my life to Jesus, I'm pushing all in because he gave me the hand. He knows exactly what I have. He knows where I'm going. Everything you own is simply on loan. We need to go all in. Your life as a child of God, you know where your destination is. So what happens if somebody doesn't like you? So what happens if somebody gets mad at you? You're doing it for the cause of Christ. I would rather Jesus be satisfied with me than somebody like me. Because I want Jesus to be honored with me. If somebody doesn't like me, you know, at the church, you know, we want them to come into church and we want them to enjoy the church. But you know what our church will never do? And I hope this doesn't offend you. We will never water down the gospel of Jesus Christ to make somebody happy. Amen. What we will always do is to share what Jesus Christ did. He died. He went all in for the cause of Jesus Christ. If somebody is offended by the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am sorry. But I do not want to offend Jesus because I'm not water, because I'm not preaching the truth and watering down the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must go all in. Here's what I want to do. I want to read a poem to you. It's about a church that had four people in the church. And those four people's names were everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. The church needed help financially and everybody was asked to participate. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but you know who did it? Nobody. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody had anybody could have done it. Help. When help was needed in the ministries of the church, somebody was asked to volunteer and somebody resented them asking him because anybody could have done it. It was really everybody's job to work and to give into it, but nobody and nobody did it. It went on and on. Whatever needed to be done, nobody could be counted on to do it. Nobody visited the sick. Nobody offered to fill in the kids' church or the ministries. Nobody offered to give a little extra. Nobody shared his faith or others. Nobody was very faithful partner of the church. And then one day, somebody left the church and took anybody and everybody with them. And guess who was left? Nobody. The truth. Everybody needs somebody. But nobody doesn't need anybody. The church we are either anybody's, somebody's, or nobody's, or everybody's. What this church needs is everybody to be on the same ground. If the church needs something done, it's everybody's job. If the church needs to be financed, it's everybody's job. Not somebody's or nobody's, it's everybody's. See, this church needs to be unified. We've had a great 62 years. And I share this in counseling all the time. But I want to take a stinking key out. And I want to lock the door of the past 62 years. And say those 62 years were good. But the best days of this church are in front of us. Yeah. What would it be like if we started a church today? What would it be like if we started the church today? today. And each and every one of us are charter members of this church. What would it be like if we had five, six hundred people that said, I want to change this community? What it would say is, I'm going all in. It's not nobody's job. It's not somebody's job. It's not anybody's job. It's our job. So often after 60 years of ministry. Churches are shutting the doors. The average age of a church member across the planet or across the United States is 67 years of age. The average age. What happens to a church when they don't change? The age of the church grows. And what happens is the younger generation says it's irrelevant. It's not for me. So they go off and do their own thing. And churches that once were sold out all in for the body of Christ when they were young 
are now dead because they're old. Because they said, this is my church. And folks, this is not your church. This is not my church. It's his church. And I'm asking you to go on, not for Glenville, and not for Pastor Bruce. We need to go all in for Jesus. And if this church, if you, say, so you know what? I'm pushing my life to the center of the table. I'm playing on his money. He's given me everything I have. He's given me my life, my finances, my job. It's his. I surrender all. Really? Really? Do I surrender what's convenient? Do I surrender what's left over? I want, to t I want to share an illustration that my dad gave to me. He didn't even know he taught me this lesson. Some of the best lessons that your dad ever teaches you when he just talks and you listen. Well, may go where I grew up. They, they went to a state playoff game in Parsons, Kansas. And uh, our car was old, it was decrepit, and it wouldn't have made it uh, those four hours from Wamego to Parsons. So we got a van from a guy that drove us, and we all rode with him. And, uh, and my dad at the gas station said, said uh, I got this tank of gas. And then we got there, and then on the way back, my dad says, I got this tank of gas. And I said, why dad buy the tank of gas, man? He, he, the guy that owns a car should drive and should pay for some of the gas. And uh, I asked my dad when we got back, I said, Dad, why'd you buy the gas? He goes, because it wasn't my car. And he said, I don't want anybody ever to think that I'm not willing to pay for the trip. And I, I learned a lesson. And I still do this today. If somebody's driving me someplace, I'm paying for the gas. I'm buying the dinner. I want them to know I appreciate what they've done for me. Something changed in my life when I was in Paris, Texas. Um, yeah, Paris, Texas. And um, we had a bunch of old deacons. And we had a dinner. And uh, I, was, I was the only guy on staff. I had the pastor and me. So I, my job was to set everything up, tear everything down, to do everything. And, and uh, I made an announcement at the end of the dinner. I said, guys, if I could have some of you guys to help me um, pick up the tables and chairs and to clean up, it would sure help me out. And this old man, the chairman of the deacon board, walked right up to me and he said, son, what's wrong with your hands? I said, what? He goes, that's what we hire you to do. I always remembered that. You know, and it took me for a long time to ever ask anybody to set up tables or to tear down a chair because I didn't want anybody to think that I wasn't willing to do whatever it took. But now I've learned it's not my job. It's our job. It's not my church. It's our church. If I want to go all in, I can go all in all I want. And it's not going to change the church. You know what's going to change the church? If everybody goes all in. If everybody sets up the tables. If everybody changes the view of the church. Next Sunday, we're having our Chivalgo Awards. And this week, as we were going through staff, do you have any idea how many volunteers that we have? We have 200 volunteers at this church. The people to say, I don't get paid, but I love Jesus. I don't get to sit in church. You know, there's probably 50 workers out there right now that's serving our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our nursery, and our preschool that's not in here today. And they do that all the time. They sacrifice church so they can serve you so you can be in church. They're going all in. I'm going to ask our church to go all in. This invitation is I surrender all. I'm asking you to surrender. Surrender your time. Surrender your money. 
Surrender your life for Christ. You're playing on house money. You cannot lose. He has given you the best hand, the best life, and I believe the best church to go all in with. Go all in. Do what God wants you to do. If there's area in your life that you're saying that I can't give this to him, he cannot bless you the way that he wants to bless you until you're first saying, Lord, I surrender some or I surrender all. And when you surrender all, watch the floodgate of heaven open up and bless you. Watch God rebuke the devourer of your money. You need to go all in with your marriage, your finances, your job, and your church. And when you can do that, you can see what God can do. He can go all in with you because you're all in for Him. Dear Lord, be with us today. Allow us to understand what going all in is. It's putting you at the preeminent place of our life. And everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we spend is on you. Everything that we have is yours. Everything that we do should be in honor of you. So Lord, bless us today. Let us be the church that everybody wants to honor. That nobody is left out. That somebody serves every area of the church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Are there areas?